Hello folks. So this is the second lesson after the Easter holidays, just to try and uh, kind of give you some context. Um, there is a test for you to have a go at, and then the first lesson, or the, I should say the first lot of new content, was all about sediment in the coastal system, which started on page 20. This is after that, okay? So we're on page 24 uh, of your coastal module booklets, and we're going to look at two things today. One thing that there is a little bit of information in the module on page 24, and one bit that you're going to have to take some notes on yourself, which is why there's a nice space at the bottom of page 24 for you. Okay, so we're going to look at structure. Now, structure is to do with geology, but we need to just focus on that for a second because geology, which is obviously about box, well, sorry, geologists, it's a lot more than that, but in the context of what we're saying, geology is about the rocks that you find on a coastline. We've kind of already touched on geology, uh, which is depending on what rock type you have, will dictate. Um, how easy it is to erode and I'm sure that uh, what you talked about in your 15 mark questions I am going to be marking those this week um, but what you will have been talking about is how some rocks erode very quickly and others erode much more slowly and that information was on page 14 that today is not that today we're talking about how those rocks are put together what the rock is actually made out of is its lithology, but we're now looking at the structure, which isn't a very big part of the syllabus at all. But what we have to understand is that the, re the way that the rocks are put together and a couple of aspects of that will affect the appearance of your coastline. And I've just got some photos to show you. So you can see, as I scroll through these pictures, that these coastlines all look quite different to each other. Yeah, now there will be loads of reasons for that, but one of the reasons that these coastlines look so different to each other is the structure. All right, so that's the basic principle of what we're talking about for the first part of this video. Uh, sorry, I should just say to you, um, I believe that's Cornwall. Uh, ditto, I think that's the Lizard Peninsula. Um, that is over on the east coast of the UK. That, of course, is much closer to home. This is part of the Jurassic coastline. Um, so, stair hole. These are the Cliffs of Moa, I believe their name is. They're in Northern Ireland. Um, anyway, okay. So, a couple of little bits for you to uh, write down. You can pause the video if I go too fast for you. So words that potentially could come up in exam questions, they're not huge parts of the syllabus, but just words that would be useful to recognise. Um, sedimentary rocks, which are one type of rock, I'm not going to get into the rock cycle and all of that today, but sedimentary rocks tend to form in layers. And if you look at the photograph in front of you, you can see some beautiful layers in that rock. Those layers are called beds. Okay, so bedding planes or beds are about layers in a rock. Now, those bedding planes might dip, which means they're not perfectly flat anymore. They will always have been formed flat because, of course, these layers are formed under the influence of gravity. So if you can imagine, for example, sedimentary rocks get created at the bottom of the sea, things die, drop to the bottom, they get squashed over millions and millions of years and they might get lithified, so they might get turned into rock. That's going to happen under the influence of gravity, so you're always going to get the bedding planes forming in flat layers. But we live on a moving earth, an earth with plate tectonics, and once rocks are created, all sorts of things happen to them, and you might get what's called dip, and you can see that the rocks in the photograph in front of you are definitely no longer horizontal. And dip can change the appearance of your coastline quite spectacularly. Okay. Folding, 
is also very much to do with plate tectonics. If you can imagine, I'm sure you all know this, that the outer solid edge of the Earth's, uh, sorry, the outer solid edge of the Earth is called the crust and it moves around. We'll talk about that in year two when we get onto plate tectonics. But the immense kind of pressures and things that are happening when lumps of um, Earth are moving around the planet, you get folding, which is the picture on the left hand side, and you get faulting, which is the picture on the right hand side. Folding is quite beautiful, it gives you some lovely results, and you can see that the originally flat bedding planes are very definitely not flat anymore. And on the right hand photo, you can see that the bedding planes don't match up anymore because something has caused um, a massive shift, usually earthquakes, plate tectonics, that kind of thing. All of those things change the appearance of your coastline and that's really all we're trying to get at. Okay? Um, fractures in rocks, you may have been to the place in this photograph, this is Haytor Rock on Dartmoor, it's one of the most accessible tours. Um, so the granite you can see is split into kind of blocks, into sections, and we call the cracks in that joints. That has quite a lot of significance for coastal processes because if you have cracks in your rock, that is what's going to be weathered and eroded and attacked. They are lines of weakness and those lines of weakness are the, the way in, if you like, for your coastal erosional processes. Um, so the rock is not yet completely separated but you can pretty much see that it will be over time. The diagrams that you've got on page 24 just are attempting to give you a suggestion of the relationship between the structure of your cliff and how it might change the appearance of your coastline. I do not need you to learn these off by heart, it's just to give you a sense of, oh, if the bedding planes are flat, actually you're going to get quite steep-sided cliffs, whereas if the cliffs are dipping towards the sea, you can see that they are much more likely to collapse because of weathering, mass movement, etc. Because gravity is already helping in terms of them collapsing. If you've got bedding planes like that, they're going to be quite um, gentle sloping, etc. etc. So there is ab oh, sorry, sneak preview of Finding Nemo there. Wait a second. It's just the idea that the structure of um, the rocks will change the appearance of the coastline with a couple of key words for you to maybe jot down. All right. Now, Finding Nemo, what the hell is that about? Now, the reason I put a Finding Nemo photo up at this point is generally it catches people's attention. Uh, but you might remember that there's quite an important thing that is uh, needed in Finding Nemo, which is the EAC, the East Australian Current. If you've never seen Finding Nemo, you've got no idea what I'm talking about, but I highly recommend it. I think it's brilliant. I love it as a movie. Focus on the EAC if you do decide to watch it for old time's sake, and it will get across to you um, the significance of a current. Because currents are actually movements of water. And basically, if you don't know the story, uh, Dory and Nemo hitch a ride in the EAC as part of their adventures because the current is actually flowing. It's a movement of water. And that makes it very different to a wave, which I've talked about in a previous video, um, because waves, the, the water molecules basically just do a little circular movement. They, um, the, the water doesn't really move across the oceans, just like in a Mexican way, people don't run around the stadium, individual people just stand up and sit down, okay? If you've never seen Finding Nemo and you haven't got access to the movie, I have just put a very short little clip uh, which you can watch if you wish to. Uh, the PowerPoint, by the way, is in the Coasts folder and it's called Structure and Currents, so it should be pretty easy to find. Um, so we're only interested in one particular type of current this year, which is the onshore, offshore, i.e. towards the coast and away from the coast, we talk about global scale ones, but the Finding Nemo kind of ones next year. So, onshore and offshore currents. We've already learned two of them, actually. We've learned swash and backwash. So as water moves up the beach, 
its wash and as it drains back to the ocean, backwash. Remember, swash is always in the direction of the wind, whereas backwash is always at 90 degrees because it's purely controlled by gravity. So swash and backwash, we kind of already know. I'm just going to add one more to what you need to know for year one, and they're rip currents. Now, I sort of hope you don't know anything about rip currents because they're pretty scary, horrible things. If you're a surfer or a sea swimmer, I kind of hope you do really know about them um, because it's quite important too. So rip currents are very powerful currents that go offshore and the reason they make the news is they're really quite effective in dragging people out of their depth um, and unfortunately sometimes people drown. So you've got a couple of speeds up there. I know that doesn't sound really fast, which is why I've put the very end of that sentence, uh, which is faster than an Olympic swimmer. So these are really fast currents. The way to spot them, weirdly, is where you can't really see very definitive waves. So I've put some red arrows on the photograph at the top. Um, hopefully you will never ever get caught in a rip current. Um, they're not particularly nice things, but this is just, you don't need to know this for geography. I'm telling you this just as a public service announcement, really. If you ever did find yourself in a rip, what tends to happen is people panic and they try and swim against it. So the rip current is dragging you offshore very powerfully. And what human nature tends to do, you go into panic mode and you try and swim against it and you try and swim in you are not going to be more powerful than a rip current, all right? That is not going to happen. So if you look at the diagram at the bottom of the slide, you can see what you have to do is try and take a deep breath, get rid of the panic and swim to the side. And apparently, I have never been stuck in a rip, so I can't speak from personal experience. Apparently, you can escape them relatively easily. It's just that you have to go against your kind of human nature, which is telling you just swim in land. You have to go to the side. Um, I won't open this right now, but you can see there's a hyperlink up in the top right hand corner of the screen. Uh, that's got some quite scary footage, but it's also got some advice from the RNLI. So if you want to know a little bit more about rip currents, then uh, that is one place that you could find it. And that's it for page 24. Neither of those are crucial parts of the coastal module, but um, they are little parts of the jigsaw puzzle for you to know about. Okay, now the next page, page 25, has a really brilliant geophile article. Um, at some point, it would be really worth you having a read through and highlighting because what it does is it basically takes quite a lot of the knowledge that we've been going through up until this point and it sort of joins it all together and makes you realise that all of these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that I've given you in each of the videos is beginning hopefully to make um, a bit of a, a picture. So pages 25 to 28 and then the next time I do a video we will um, start looking at coastal landforms. Come on Mr Mouse, there we are. Um, so we'll be moving on to something slightly different. Okay, thank you very much everyone, hope you're all okay.